Thank you. So um, I, uh, I am here to introduce Anders Berenson. I've known Anders for I don't even know how many years now, four, I guess. Um, and I got to know Anders through this project that he's going to show you today called The Chopstick at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. If you all haven't been down to the IMA to see the 100 Acres Park, you must do it. There's the Chopstick Project, which is amazing, and there's a Marlon Blackwell Visitor's Pavilion, which is excellent, and the campus, is, the campus itself is just beautiful. The park is amazing. With the fall weather, just plan to go tomorrow because it's gorgeous. Um, you don't want to miss it. Um, and it's free. You just have to go there and go in. It's free. Um, so Anders uh, uh, came to the IMA, started working at the, the IMA, with his uh, partner in Vision Division um, because the curator of contemporary art found their work online. And she was so taken by their, what she called a quirky approach to nature, that um, everything they do looks at nature in a really interesting way. So um, the Royal University of Technology in Stockholm, which is where Anders teaches, was uh, kind enough to bring him here. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. So, Anders Berenson. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for letting me speak here. Uh, it's a pleasure always to be in Indiana. I've been here now. This is my fifth time in Indiana since I've been working with, uh, uh, with the Chopstick Project. And it's really my uh, sort of hometown in, in uh Indianapolis is my hometown in the United States somehow. <laughs> I love it. Uh, well, I introduce myself first. Uh, uh, I'm from Sweden, from Stockholm. Uh, born in Stockholm, 1980. Uh, started my career as a carpenter. Uh, and then I started to study at Chalmers uh, Technical University in Gothenburg. Uh, I did a, studied there for three years. I uh, did my internship at, at OMA, that was sort of the only time I've been employed. Uh, and then I started at the uh, Royal Technical University in Stockholm, where I teach now. Uh, and then I graduated at Chalmers. That's kind of a long story. We, we actually were not in Gothenburg, we were in South America. Uh, started our office there. Uh, didn't get so much uh, <laughs> projects. Uh, we did one project in Bolivia. I'm not going to show it today uh, for, for some miners. It's a sacrifice place for, for miners in Bolivia. Uh, and then uh, directly after school, uh, we, I started my office and Ulf started his office. But when we collaborate, uh, we call ourselves Vision Division. Uh, we collaborate a lot, uh, especially also in, in, in this case in Indianapolis we, when we did the shop stick. Uh, I'm also involved uh, uh, in a sort of architectural collaboration called Svensk Standard, which I maybe worked like 5% on, and that's basically uh, Swedish architects that are bored at their current job. <laughs> so we, we kind of do stuff outside that. I'm not bored at that, my job. I have my own firm, and I love it, you know. But, but many Swedes are, so, so I'm working with them. Uh, and I'm also teach at, at KTH. Uh, 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 40% uh, I've been teaching in the third year for three years and now I'm uh, starting my own studio at KTH which I hope to be able to speak a bit uh, about uh, later in, the, in this lecture. I know uh, this lecture is, is a bit too long so I will try to go fast and if you need to go you know because you have classes you know just go it's, 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 my, it's my fault so. Uh, I would like to talk uh, I thought uh, when I was going to do this guest lecture, uh, I've seen a lot of guest lectures. And uh, they often, at least in Sweden, tend to be these kind of like almost James Bond lectures. Uh, someone goes to a place and they erect this sort of beautiful stunt and then they go to another place and they just move around and do these you know, amazing buildings. But when you see seven of them, you maybe want some sort of lecture where you can sort of identify with sort of smaller projects and so on. So this uh, lecture will only be actually about Stockholm. Uh, we do some international projects too, but uh, I will focus on Stockholm and some early works. Uh, and we will go from the Stockholm countryside into the city center of Stockholm. 
Uh, and before, before we do that, uh, I thought I would give a brief introduction uh, to Sweden and, and Swedish architecture, so you sort of know where you are when, we, when I started talking about the projects. And then I will, of course, also start uh, talk about Shopstick, and I hope to be able to talk about uh, the studio a little bit also. Uh, so I start with uh, a brief introduction to Sweden. Uh, and that's basically, first of all, you need to know where Sweden is. Uh, Sweden is in Europe. Uh, it's up there far in the north. You see the, the green color. That's Sweden. Uh, so we're neighbors to Norway, Finland, Denmark, uh, the Baltic states, Poland, Germany, Russia. Uh, but if you look at the world map, you also see that we are on a very hi uh, high altitude in, uh, on this planet. We're at the same level of, uh, as Alaska. Uh, doesn't mean that we have the same climate as Alaska. We have pretty much the same climate as in, in, in the Indiana, actually. Uh, but it means that uh, we have a, a, lot, a very dark winter and a very light summer. Uh, so in the winter time, we have uh, around three or four hours of, of daylight, and in the summertime we, we have the opposite, so three or four hours of, of, of night. Some Swedish history, we're mostly famous for being Vikings, I think. Uh, we started off in, you know, year 800 to 1200, we tried to trade with people, but they didn't want our poor things, so we ended up killing them and <laughs> taking their things. Uh, and uh, we're one of the oldest countries in, uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, when we formed a country in the, in the 12th century, we, we continued the Viking approach, starting war with everyone. Uh, and quite successful, we, but we fought against Russia, Germany, everyone at the same time. And uh, exactly 200 years from now, uh, we sort of said that let's stop uh, with the war thing. And we actually have had uh, 200 years of peace. Uh, so this is uh, kind of Sweden today. We haven't been in war for 200 years. Uh, we're a pretty small country in the north of Europe. We're 9 million people. Uh, the biggest city is, is Stockholm. It's about uh, 2 million people with the suburbs. And uh, most, of, most of the Swedes live in the southern part of Sweden. Uh, and the northern part is only one million people. Um, I would like to talk, I'm just going to do a very brief introduction to Swedish architecture. If we would have a sort of a historical professor here, he would probably say, I'm, you know, this is a shit thing, but, uh, uh, you know, we need to go fast here. And, uh, and I, I, yeah. So basically, before the 20th century, I would say that Swedish architecture is architecture made by architects. Uh, very little architect, uh, architecture, and that's basically, you know, imported styles uh, from the rest of Europe, from, from France, Germany, and so on. And then we have a lot of, of vernacular architecture on the countryside. Uh, the, the, the picture I on the below here is a, it's a typical vernacular uh, farmhouse from Sweden. Uh, and, um, yeah, it's basically, you know, you, you're restricted by the by the length of the uh, trunks on the trees and, and this typical red color for Sweden also, uh, which is actually, uh, we, we have a copper mine and, and the uh, products that came out from this production, we made this uh, red color. And I would say at least 60% of the Swedish houses on the countryside is, has this uh, red color. And you will also see some of my projects has this red color. It's, uh, um, and here you see Stockholm, uh, you see the su southern island uh, where sort of the poor people live. They had this vernacular architecture and on the north part of Stockholm we have this uh, uh, architecture made by architects. Uh, this is uh, inspired by French castles and this is uh, the most expensive uh, road in, in Stockholm. Uh, but I was begin with the 20th century to talk about that. Uh, Sweden tried to sort of form its own uh, style in architecture, sort of national romantic style that later became uh, what we call the Swedish Grace. And this is perhaps one of the most famous buildings in, in Sweden. It's uh, the city hall in Stockholm made by Ragnar Östberg. 
uh, one of the most expensive buildings ever been built in Sweden. Uh, it has a lot of references to Venice uh, and to the Marcus place, but still, it's, it, in, if you go into it, it's, it's this Viking room and so on, and it has these Swedish symbols. And it's, it's a huge building for being a brick building. You see the three uh, golden crowns uh, at the top. They're as big as a Volkswagen bus. So it's a uh, it's, uh, very impressive building. You might recognize it if you look, look at the Noble Party. Uh, that's where, the, where it is. Um, so I move on to, um, uh, in 1915, uh, perhaps two of the most famous Swedish architects, uh, Gunnar Asplund and Sigurd Leverens, uh, won a competition for the Woodland Chapel. And these are the two first buildings at the Woodland Chapel. Uh, it took time to build them. They're sort of finished in the, in the 20s. Uh, and uh, now you can see that the sort of the Swedish grace is starting to take its form. It's kind of a simple architecture. It has a lot to do with landscaping. Uh, the building doesn't begin where, you know, where the building is. It begins uh, before that, when you start entering this you know, uh, uh, wooden cemetery. So uh, at, the, at the top part there you see this sort of gate into the woods, and that's sort of where the building starts. The ceiling on, on that gate is very low, so I have to go like this. And that kind of, you know, helps, helps you to transit into this sort of, you know, uh, uh, wood, woodland. Uh, and then it's really this sort of directed moves into the house. And that's, I think, is kind of typical for, for that period of Swedish architecture. But also, it's a very simple architecture, and you put the details often close to the entrance and so on, just like the, where I showed this uh, vernacular house at the beginning, the red house. It's, it's typical like that. It's, it's, it's a very simple house, and then where the entrance is, you put a lot of effort and so on. Um, if you continue uh, into 1928, uh, this is a work by Gunnar Asplund. Maybe you recognize it. Uh, it's his city library, and it sort of have, have the same uh, approach to it. You really how you enter the building. You enter it through this, through this stair, you see the cylinder, and then you get sort of squeezed in, and then you come, come into the cylinder of books. Uh, I'm just showing this because it's, you know, one of the most famous buildings in Sweden, really. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, Swedes, we are like sort of a consensus-seeking people, we don't like to disagree a lot, you know. So when we sort of we like, we agree on something, most people agree on it. And in the 1930s, we had this exhibition, Stockholm exhibition, where we decided to become modernists. And it was really over a night. We had like some buildings that were modernistic before that, but all the architects said, let's be modernistic. <laughs> and uh, we were about 4 million people in Sweden at that time, and about 500,000 people uh, visited uh, this uh, exhibition, which is uh, a lot for, uh, for that time. And, uh, and that uh, really was the starting point for Swedish modernism. Um, and uh, at the same time, in 1921, uh, Sweden became sort of a true democracy, where, where women could start voting also. So everybody could start voting at 1921. And then also the Labour Party started to sort of become the big party in Sweden, or the Socialist Party. And the Socialist Party, uh, they kind of took that modernism to them also. That, uh, so it was sort of a collaboration between the Socialist Party and the architects in Sweden that we will do uh, modernistic architecture for working class people. Um, so it was an agreement that, you know, politics should be sort of radical and modern, and so should architecture be. Um, and this is one example. Uh, uh, in 1932, they built row houses uh, uh, just outside Stockholm. And of course, the prime minister of Sweden moves into one of the row houses. This is actually a picture from his 50th birthday, where people come and congratulate him. And Sweden is, was that kind of country anyway, that, you know, you could actually talk to the prime minister in the streets, and, uh, but then one got killed, and then we're, yeah, different country. Uh, this is one uh, nice example on, on how sort of 
socialism and architecture meet each other. It's, the, it's called the Kollektivhus. It's made by Sven Markelius in 1935. He later became the, the city chief architect in Stockholm. And um, just the thought of what a modern person would be. Uh, since sort of Sweden decided that both women and uh, men should start working, there would be no, uh, uh, no one home to cook. So uh, instead of making kitchens, uh, there's a restaurant uh, below, and then there's a food elevator, because apparently, you know, the women can't cook anymore if both are going to work. And uh, there's also a daycare center uh, at the bottom, and there's the washing machines and so on uh, on the top. Uh, so typical sort of so socialistic architecture, very small apartments, but very, very thought through. Uh, uh, the 40s, uh, we just sort of continue. I'm sorry for the resolution on the pictures uh, I see now. Uh, but um, I'm showing you this picture is, is perhaps the most famous building in Sweden. It's made by Gunnar Asplund also. It's the woodland. It's the continuation of the woodland uh, cemetery, and it's the, the last sort of uh, church uh, they made there. And it's um, once again the landscape. You're entering on a small path in this big field. You're entering through this, uh, well, you, this room you see there, and then you go into the church, and you know you have your ceremony. And while you're at the ceremony, the, the wall on, behind you is, is lowering down in, in, in the ground disappearing without the sound, and when you're through with the ceremony, you, you, you know, just walk out in the landscape. It's a very like refined and really nice uh, 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 project. So you should really go to the Woodland Cemetery if you're, if you're in Stockholm. Uh, here you can also see Gunnar Asplund, uh, his way to become a modernist, uh, really from you know, classicism. This is just one project. I see the text is missing a bit too, but it's the courthouse in Gothenburg. He started with it in, in, I think it was 1913, and he finished it in 1937. So it's a very long period to design something, but you can also see on the sketches then how they, you know, the, the style changes from being a classicist to being a modernist. Uh, this is a picture from 1945. Uh, it's called the uh, Hemmes Forskningsinstitut. It's the research institute for the home. Uh, the sort of government continues to be so co collaborating with the architects, uh, and they make this research institute where basically they go home to people and they start measuring how they're working, and uh, they have this ideal uh, Swedish woman. She's 158. Uh, that's the measurement of her, and. Uh, and that kind of sets all the measurements for the kitchen and so on and how they should work. And uh, it's almost like uh, when you look at it, it's a bit co a comedian story or something. But uh, that's how it was. And uh, still these measurements is, is actually what we're using today too, you know, when you're in the kitchen and so on. And I'm not, uh, you know, 158. I'm much taller, but, you know. Um, and also this is a poster for the Social Democratic Party also, you know, we, we build the land, you know, we, we're rebuilding modern houses for, for the working class. Oh, bad picture again. Uh, but this is in 1950s. Uh, we, we continue this project, but then we do something called the ABC city, which means that we build suburbs uh, where, you should, where you should be able to both work, uh, live, and also to be able to do the shopping there. Suburbs, you, you shouldn't be able to leave. Uh, uh, and we do a lot of these suburbs, and they're very, you know, people really like them. There's movies from that time. People are moving out from the city to the suburbs. Uh, it's fresh, it's clean, and so on. And in the 60s, we think that everybody should have a new house. So we start the Million Program, which means we're going to build uh, one million new uh, apartments uh, in 10 years. Uh, and this is kind of when Sweden goes into really mass production. So we get big building companies uh, and big architectural offices. And they're still in Sweden today. Uh, for example, we have in Stockholm, 
you know, Sweden is as big as Indiana, Indiana roughly, I guess, in, in terms of population. We have three offices that have more than 600 people, uh, uh, employees, and uh, we have four really big uh, building companies. And they sort of, you know, they grow from this, this period. Uh, and at the same time, I haven't talked so much about Sigurd Leverens. He, he made that Woodland Chapel thing, and then uh, people thought that you can't work with him, he's impossible. So he started actually manufacturing windows. Uh, but at this time in the 1960s, uh, architecture started asking themselves, like, what happened to, to beauty? We're just mass producing stuff. And then someone, you know, finds Sigurd Leverens again <laughs> from the 1920s. To, Can you make a church? And, uh, and this is really his, I think, glorious period when he's about, I don't know, 70 or 80 or something like that. He starts, he builds two churches that are really like masterpieces in, in Sweden. And I know you know a lot about Leverens too. And here you can see the, the windows also that, you know, the windows are often placed just directly to the wall, so it looks almost like a ruin when you get into the churches. And there's also a lot of, for example, like brickworks. Uh, I don't know the word for it, but you know the area between the bricks where you put in the sort of concrete uh, thing, it's uh, it's bigger to sort of match the birch uh, wood outside and so on. It's, uh, and this is also a very nice example. Uh, Maybe the, one of the last nice examples of this sort of mass production thing is an is a architect from Gothenburg called Erik Friberger who thinks that, yeah, we can mass produce houses, but we can also mass produce plots. So he's make this uh, house where, where you actually just get a plot and then you build your house uh, in this plot. So you can, you know, your family grows and so on, so you can you know, build and shrink your house and so on. And I think this is a very unique example. I haven't seen it anywhere else but uh, and then in the 1970s when we do this million program people before that people sort of really liked the new things going on but after the million program uh, people started protesting uh, uh, Sweden was not in the world war for example and we thought we need to modernize the city so the, in the rest of, of Europe you know, the cities were bombed and then they built new stuff. But we kind of like, oh, let's tear down the city and build <laughs> a new city, you know, like <laughs> almost doing war to ourselves. Uh, and, uh, and that really got this protest movements. And in the 1970s, you know, where postmodernism started growing in Sweden, it really became just this, you know, way of this word like, it should blend in with uh, the other houses around it. It's, it's the important thing, traditional houses, you know, and, and um, this is one example built in, in, in the 70s and 80s in, in, in Sweden. It's in, in Gothenburg, where you really just sort of mimic the old structure that was there and uh, uh, often forget the most important things about the structure, which is not the look. For example, in this place in Hag, it was stores everywhere on the bottom floor. They took that away and it's now it's kind of a dead area. Um, and that kind of continued for a very long time. I think it still continues in some municipalities today that it, you know, houses should blend in, really. And this is sort of the latest agreement, I guess, uh, at least for Stockholm. And that is, you know, today they talk about let's build a city. That's what it's about. We should build a city. And a city is basically, you know, this grid. And it's supposed to be... Um, seven story high. It's everywhere. If you build something new in Stockholm, it should be seven story high. Uh, and Stockholm sort of, Stockholm owns the land. The municipality owns the land and they sell it then to the big contractors uh, who sort of develop a city. So it's basically very large blocks and uh, to make them look smaller, look, make, make them look more like a city, they put different colors on it, you know. So it should look like different houses, but it's, it's actually one big house. And, and this really this sort of real estate values that you put in. It's, it's a balcony, a big window, if there's an ocean view. Uh, everyone should have an oak floor, this kind of things. And it pretty much look the same. And what's left for the architect is often, you know, this facade thing, coloring it. <laughs> make the floor panel, make the uh, color for the, for, for the facade. And you can see it here also, you know, trying to 
have fun with some green color or something like that. And, and uh, it's, it's absolutely what's happening today. I met a friend who was called me last week, you know, crying. I've been on a building meeting. I'm going to build my first apartment building. And the first thing they tell him is, you know, like the height of everything. And uh, this is actually for an exhibition. So the height and that and that and that. And he's like, what, what about the architecture? It's like, it, it comes later, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when, when we fix these things, you can be an architect. Um, but there's sort of a plus side to it, and that's sort of this is an architecture that most people actually like compared to the 1960s. A lot of people move in there, and it's kind of well planned areas. Uh, uh, and uh, it's also a quite high, lower standard when it comes to, for example, climate and so on. It's a very in well insulated house, they're very, we have a lot of norms, you know, for handicapped people that should be able to move everywhere and so on. So it's, it's a kind of a high-low standard. Uh, the bad thing about it, I think, is it, it goes too slow when you, we have a, you know, everybody, this, Stockholm is one of the fastest growing cities in, in, uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, but uh, these projects take a very long time. There's a very few big actors doing this. Uh, and these big actors are this is the builders that that sort of controls the process, and they kind of you know take architects that don't you know interfere with their you know building uh, systems. Uh, so, and here here you see sort of one of the new newest uh, developments in Stockholm. We develop a lot along the shorelines in all these industrial areas it's, it's really been the places where we build a sort of new new city in Stockholm. Uh, so this one will be finished in, well it goes in different, uh, some parts have already been built but they're continuing to building this one. It's called Norra Djurgårdstaden. Uh, and you see this typical grid, it's seven story high and uh, that's you know, that's our agreement somehow that that's, that's how Stockholm should look like. Uh, and here you see Hammarby Sjöstad has been built uh, already, uh, also seven story high buildings. Uh, and here is uh, Haga Staden, which is another example. And, and there you also we have two skyscrapers, it's often like that, that the, the Swedish building companies, they get most of the plots, and then we get one plot to, to Remkolas or to Herzog and Demoron to kind of, so this is, I think Rem Kolas is going to design these two skyscrapers. Uh, and uh, here you see a rendering of a new, yeah, new house in Stockholm. And it, I think it looks pretty much as the 60s, really. But it's just, you know, but you put on some fun balconies or something. That's sort of what, what the architect do, you know. Make something fun out of this, and then you tilt the balconies like that. Uh, and there's also a protest movement again. Uh, it's the people from 68. They're back. Uh, <laughs> we have this uh, project called Slussen in Stockholm, uh, which, which actually, the, one, it, the competition was won in the 1980s. And this is Swedish democracy. You know, it's like everybody can sort of like appeal or like, so, uh, and, and the latest appeal is from ABBA, you know ABBA, Waterloo, uh, big, big music group from, yeah, the, yeah, <laughs> maybe you don't listen to ABBA anymore, but uh, they were a very big, big Swedish band. Uh, so they're stopping Slussen again now. Uh, so there's uh, these protest movements, uh, also saving, saving one tree and so on. But it's not really a protest movement on, for example, how should we build more houses fast for students. We have a lack of 10,000 of, of student apartments, for example, in Stockholm, so they're living in tents. So if you want to come to us and, you know, study, we can offer you a tent. <laughs> uh, so I will talk about, so I will show my projects now, and it's, um, so I will start on the Swedish countryside. Uh, just north of Stockholm, and then I will go slowly into Stockholm and the city center. Uh, so here you see uh, Uppland, uh, where we will start. 
It's one of the oldest sort of small states in, in Sweden. Uh, and you see uh, below there is Stockholm. Uh, well, how can I explain it? It's like Stockholm is the biggest city in Sweden. It's Sweden's New York, maybe. We have a subway line and so on. And then we have Uppsala, which might be Sweden's Boston. We have the big university there and so on. And then uh, we have the coastline where I'm from, which maybe is Sweden's uh, Cape Cod or something like that, where all the people from Stockholm go to have vacations. But we still have, like, it's still the countryside, really, especially in the winters and so on. Uh, my first project uh, is up... Uh, yeah, at the far north of, of Uppland. It's, called, it's a small city called Herring. Uh, and this is the first commission I got. It's sort of a dream commission. Um, it was a lady who asked, who asked me that um, she wanted a modern house in Herring. And it shouldn't cost uh, less than a million dollars. <laughs> it should be the best house Herring ever got. Um, and we sort of walked around looking for sites and so on. And we find this old sort of like... Um, you call it a quarry, you know, there where uh, it has been mining before and it's a water filled uh, uh, hole. And we find that hole and it was sort of like a trash dump. And uh, we thought that's a good site. She buys that site, she cleans it up, and then we put the house right over the quarry. Um, so this is, this is the project. Uh, she has a lot of guests and so on. So she will be living in the, in the end, the lower end, and the guests will come to the to the upper end and uh, then you meet in the living room and then you can jump out from the, from the living room and you can swim in this old quarry and uh, really nice, really nice project. Uh, here you see the floor plan and you can jump down there and uh, yeah, uh, here's the facade and here's a model I made. Um, but what happened uh, with this project is that, um, well, we, building, we seek a building permit for it, and it was no, 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 no. This project doesn't fit into the Swedish cultural environment. Uh, and it was also uh, in the local newspaper, described as uh, the most uh, childish project ever been proposed in, in, uh, in the municipality of, of, of Nortelje. Uh, and it, uh, that this kind of architecture doesn't fit in uh, in the Swedish countryside. So that makes you want to migrate or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> like all of the Swedish countryside, you can't build anything uh, like that. So I went to OMA then uh, to do my internship. I did this in the third year. Uh, but And I showed this project for them. And... There's actually a very similar project made by OMA in, in, uh, that we did thereafter for Anish Kapoor in Bahamas. So if you can't be an architect in Sweden, you can be it in Bahamas instead, maybe. Um, yeah, so that was my beginning of being an architect in Sweden. Uh, and the next project I got was um, in the same municipality. Nutelli municipality is a really big one. And this uh, was uh, some clients who didn't get building permissions for a modern sauna they wanted to build. And then I said, I can help you to fake, you know, make a secret sauna because I hate this municipality. You know, I can <laughs> help you. <laughs> this is my revenge. Uh, so, uh, so the program is really that... Uh, it's a sound, they had building permission to build an, an old um, shed for, for keeping fish and, fishing equipment, but I said, like, I, I, I will fix that for you. You will get a sauna. Uh, so this is, the, I can go back to that later maybe. So this is the fishing shed. This is the opening. And then we open it, and then you have the sauna. And then you can close it again, and you, you know, it's a hidden sauna in a fishing shed. So that's sort of the first project I made in Sweden. Uh, and you see here, you can understand the, the building a little bit. It's, it's basically a, a simple shed. We, in Sweden, we have a lot of saunas. Uh, 
So you sit there, you have the sound and you have the shower at the back end and when you open this door you get this space uh, in front where you usually, after you take a sound and jump in the water, you go up and you have a beer on the terrace. So yeah, that's, that's how it works. Uh, here's from the inside. Uh, I visited this summer, it's always nice to visit clients again and I, you know, had some, you know, bathing sauna with them and see that everything works still and so on. It, it, it's still a nice building. Uh, here you see it. Uh, this project, we continue to be on the countryside. It's um, actually from my uh, hometown, Jesper, where I grew up. Um, and this client, uh, we have this crayfish parties in Sweden. In August, we, we, we harvest crayfish and we eat them and we drink snaps and uh, it's really a nice tradition, you know. <laughs> we eat crayfish and we, before you drink snaps, you need to sing a song also. So everybody sings and then say school and then we drink snaps and uh, we, we do that for, for a lot of occasions, but the crayfish is one of them. And, and this uh, client, he, he planted crayfishes in his lake uh, but the problem was that the crayfishes didn't like his lake, so they went to the neighbor's lake. <laughs> and uh, our project was to, to, you know, get the crayfishes back somehow. <laughs> uh, and, and we thought about, can we, do, um, can we do sort of a crayfish city, or we call it a cancer city? It's, uh, yeah. um, uh, where the crayfishes could migrate back. Uh, because, you know, we could actually, you know, fix the things that the crayfish, crayfish wanted. Uh, so we made this design for it, which is basically a concrete landscape, because the crayfishes need to, uh, to hide, especially from their, uh, their sort of biggest opponent is, is something called a, um, a heron, you know, a bird. They eat crayfishes, so they need to hide from the, cray, uh, from the heron. Uh, they also need uh, calcite which you can find in concrete, for example. Um, and they also need a certain type of plant uh, that we plant in this uh, small stream. And we did this, this is kind of a technique, a nice uh, technique to cast concrete. Um, it's a friend of us who, who started this uh, factory. It's basically bubble wrap, uh, and then you put concrete in it and then bubble wrap again. And then you have like this very heavy blanket that you can form. Uh, so we did that and just put balls and stuff under it and you get this sort of undulated landscape. Uh, and this is sort of the plan for it. Uh, and here you see the, the, that's the heron and the crayfishes. Uh, and here it's on land and here it's sank down in the water. And it's also a project where you, so the owner should be able to actually walk on this and then harvest the crayfishes. So you can lift uh, these uh, hills have small lids and then you can sort of jump in and try to get one. But it shouldn't be too easy either, so they have these small places where they can run away. It should be fun to hunt crayfishes also. Uh, so here, here it how it goes. You can, we have some lamps we put in that you can turn on when you, when you hunt them. And here you see a crayfish looking out. Uh, we throw this one, we, we planted some crayfishes there to, you know, start the population growing, really. Uh, this is very, uh, quite similar uh, place, or uh, it's also in Edsbro. Uh It's uh, a commission for, to extend an old uh, country house. Uh, uh, on the Swedish countryside here in Edsbro. And, uh, uh, well, the owner told us that uh, he wants an extension and it's going to be a bedroom, it's going to be a clothes carrying room where you iron your shirts and so on. Uh, he want, also wanted a workplace and he wanted, uh, you know, just some place to, to sit and hang out and you have breakfast and so on. Uh, and he <coughs> asked us to do this extension and he told us that he really likes traditional Swedish architecture with crossbars and so on, uh, but he t told us that uh, it's okay if you don't do it because I know you're modern architects and you hate crossbars, you know. So we said like, now you're gonna get crossbars. 
So we made this uh, small extension with a big uh, crossbar window, but on the inside we we uh, we kind of you know uh, extruded the crossbars to be functions. Uh, so a place to sit and and, and have uh, coffee, a workplace, and so on. Uh, uh, so that was kind of the architectural thing for this project. And there you see the owner in the closed caring room. And you see this crossbar window. And here you see Sweden at winter time. And here you see the owner sits and works in this crossbar window. And here you see the floor plan for it. Uh, often I think when you do extension it's almost easier to just build a, a building uh, next uh, to the to the building and not try to mess with the old building too much, just uh, put it next to it and, and make a small glass path or something into the next building. And this is what we did also. Uh, so here you see the section. One nice detail I saw on, uh, on pilot boats in Sweden, uh, we have this, uh, the railing is heated. And since we were going to put in heat in, uh, in the floor here, which also actually is heating, we could put it through the railing. So it's very nice when uh, you have the cold glass, you can, you know, touch a warm, uh, you know, what you call it, railing, handrail, uh, small details. Uh, and here you see, so this, I mean, the house is pretty ordinary, but we, we kind of focused on this, uh, uh, this big window, how to solve it. And that's maybe also a tip for, for you know, when you're young architects, you can't solve everything, but you can maybe, you know, put your effort in one detail and convince the client about that detail and then make some parts of the house more ordinary. So it's more, sort of like a compromise, but uh, uh, it's a good strategy if you want to build things. Uh, and here you see it from the outside. Uh, this next one uh, is sort of in the suburbs of Stockholm. Uh, Okay, I'm going to speed up. Uh, so this is a house for uh, two, uh, uh, this is a family, uh, one guy who, who marries this uh, Thai woman and she comes to Sweden with her two Thai kids, so they need an extension. Uh, and we thought, so this, this extension is really for, for, for two, two kids from Thailand. Uh, and we thought that uh, what, what, what is it like being a kid in, in Sweden? It's really about exploring the nature, uh, being outside. So we thought we made this house where the nature sort of go, goes into the living room uh, and where the sort of kids can just move outside from that. Uh, and uh, when we were doing this, the owners, they went away to Thailand and said just, you know, fix it. Um, and we had some Polish uh, carpenters, uh, and they started digging out the, the earth. And they thought they were going to found mountain, but they didn't. So we had sort of like a one and a half meter pit under the house. And then we talked to the carpenter and said, could you make caves in that pit? And it's like, yeah, we can make caves. We're good at concrete. So we made these two caves for the kids that they can go out, you know, like play caves from the, from the room down to the cave and then out to the nature. Uh, and we did a lot of nice things <laughs> with uh, with these Polish carpenters. Uh, uh, and this project was published in the big newspaper in Sweden. And here you see the kid reading about himself in his cave. Uh, we also made an outdoor cinema for the for the kids, um, uh, where they can watch, you know. And just IKEA shares that we cast it down in the hill. Uh, and this is sort of the floor plan, so you see that you can actually move down in the floor and out in, in the caves and so on. And, and also some details. We made a popcorn shelf outside. It's kind of nice. You can open and you can make popcorns and then you can look at the movie. Yeah. <laughs> and we put the speakers in these bird, bird houses and so on. Uh, so let's go to Stockholm. Here you see the metropolitan area of Stockholm. Uh, here you see the subway lines. Here you see the inner city of Stockholm. Here you see a picture from above Stockholm. It's a really beautiful city. You should come and visit, really. Uh, it's, it's 
sits on 16 different islands. A lot of water. Uh, this project I'm going to show you now is uh, with these collaborative people I talked about that are tired of their jobs. So they, we drink beer and then we come up with ideas. And uh, we thought we need, a, we need a place where we can uh, sort of, it's always packed in the parks in Stockholm. We need a place where we could just have some beers and, you know, relax. And you see there's a lot of water in Stockholm, so let's make a floating park. Uh, so that's what we did, and this is sort of the sketch for it. A five by five meter lawn we can hang on, and this is the built result. So we, yeah, we built this one, and we're you know going around with a motor in Stockholm, having picnics and so on. <laughs> uh, really, really nice. We had it for three years, and now we have taken it away. But uh, and if, do you see the coast guard there? They were really wondering what kind of vessel is this, you know, who's the captain and so on. It's just a floating loan, you know. And the good thing about this is that you don't need a building permit for it. And you can really, you can put it anywhere because the Swedish law says that you can't not release a boat that's lying somewhere. It's, it's unsafety. So we just put it anywhere in Stockholm and we could, you know, be anywhere with it. And the coast guards, they kind of like, yeah, fine. Yeah. Became good friends with them. Uh, this next project is also with this uh, collaboration. Uh, we were invited by an art museum to, to do something with this sort of forgotten pavilion uh, in a sort of remote park in, in Stockholm. You see where the park is there. Uh, the pavilion was uh, built in the 80s uh, and uh, we got 10,000 Swedish crowns to do something with the building. Uh, maybe put in furniture or repaint it or whatever. And um, uh, we thought that what's, you know, how can we make this building more valuable? Uh, and we thought about storytelling. Maybe we can actually give this building a new story that is much better than the story from the 80s. And since we have 10,000 Swedish crowns, which is about uh, $1,500, we can ex actually make this lie something that people believe in. Because we can put this lie in a sign that is the typical Stockholm sign. Uh, so we, thought we do that as an experiment. Uh, so this is the sign. Uh, we said that this building is made uh, 800 years ago by uh, the Swedish native Samis. A shaman blessed it and he gave it to the Swedish uh, army. And it's been in the Swedish army uh, for about 500 years in every great battle. Uh, and we photoshopped this pavilion into old Swedish paintings. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, this building, and this story is unbelievable. You know, it saved the king many times. He has used it as a fleet also one time and so on. And we thought, okay, this is, I mean, this is an art project. It's going to be taken away two, two days from, from now, you know, when, when we put it up. But, you know, the ones who actually, you know, maintaining the part, they just, you know, they just polished the design. So it's been standing there for four years. And, uh, and people are start believing in this. They, <laughs> they, they call it the Narva Pavilion, and, and uh, it's in, in literature now also, you know, like... Uh, uh, and then one lady this spring started, you know, sending to, to, to the big newspaper in Sweden, like, how come this, you know, amazing pavilion is standing in such a bad location? <laughs> why, why, why is it not on the National Museum? And then the whole thing got discovered, you know. They called the maintenance guys and they're like, it's been built by a father and his son in the 80s, you know. And it's such an obvious lie because it's, you know, glued wood and everything. It can't be, you know, it's modern technique. But uh, if you put up a, a, a sign that people believe in, they, they believe in it. And then they, you know, clear it from graffiti and so on. But now it's, now I have it on the balcony. But it was, yeah, it could stand there for, for four years. Uh, so here you see it. 
this is a project uh, commission for uh, uh, for uh, uh, KOE campus. It's uh, it's the medical institute uh, in Stockholm, and they asked us to look over the parking situation. Uh, and um, as I said before, it takes a quite long time to get building permits in Sweden. So we thought that could we try a different strategy? Could we apply for um, uh, temporary building permits? Because a parking lot is really just gravel. Um, so, so this is, was our technique that uh, if we put gravel uh, and make temporary building permits that we can get pretty much in a week, uh, we can test these uh, uh, parking lots, see which parking lots are people actually parking on uh, and which are, uh, are not used. And then when we see which ones are parked on, we could actually do a real building permit and, and put asphalt on them. So that was kind of the strategy for this, for this campus. And uh, so the sketch for this was you know, kind of fast. We just walked around on the campus finding places that were easy to fill with gravel and, and park on. Uh, and, uh, and then we gravel filled them uh, and then just looked for them for a year. You know, are they park, uh, do people park on them or not? Uh, so this one, for you, you see, it's, it's not used the first, first couple of months, but in winter time, it, it started to, to get used. Uh, this is also, we could also use, since it was a short time span, we can also use construction sites and so on that uh, were waiting to be, be built. So this is one of these. And here you see when the construction starts. Uh, we did, did all of these uh, sort of temporary uh, 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 parking lots. And then when they get well used, we, we, put, we simply did a building permit for them and, and, and asphalted them which I thought was, uh, you know, I think a very good strategy for the campus. They saw, you know, where, where they needed the parking lots and where they don't need the parking lots and where you could also see where people complained about the uh, parking lots. Um, so, yeah, a strategy for, you know, not taking too long time to, to build things. Uh, this is a proposal we did uh, one year ago. Uh, if you look at Stockholm, uh, you see there's um, a lot of water and a lot of bridges. Um, and the bridges are made for cars, uh, but the people are really walking along the shorelines of Stockholm when they're out taking a walk. Uh, the problem is then that when they're going to walk to the next island, they need to go up a couple of hundred meters and walk on the uh, uh, car bridge and then, you know, walk down 100 meters and go to the shoreline again. So we started looking at the bridges. And uh, you can look at this diagram. As you can see, the span between the islands are quite short. But if you're going to walk on the car bridge, it takes a very long time to do it. So we just suggested, why not use these spans under the bridges and make them for, like, walking spans? Uh, so this is a proposal just to do a little concrete extension to the bridge and people can walk underneath the bridge uh, and go much faster between the, the different islands. Um, and you can also have sort of like cinemas and stuff there. Uh, and there you see really that's, that's the only little thing you need to, to add actually to be able to, to, to walk much more easy in Stockholm. Uh, this is also a proposal for Stockholm. Um, it's called Stockholm Stacked. As I said before, Stockholm is one of the fastest growing cities in Europe, but there's not really much being built. Uh, and people want to live in the inner city. Uh, and uh, people say there's not enough space in the inner city. But if you look at, at just one, uh, uh, one block in the inner city, it's always one or two houses inside that block. And we suggest uh, that these houses can be as big as you want, or as tall as you want. So you can tear down the house that you don't see from the street, and you can replace it with a skyscraper. Uh, and if you do that, we could almost double uh, the population inside Stockholm. 
so this is if it would go max. It's always good. If you do this kind of renderings, people get upset and it comes in the newspaper and you get a debate and so on. Yeah? <laughs> but it's really a rule change. And I think that's important with architecture that it doesn't always have to be design. It can also be, you know, but if you change this rule, we, we can do a lot more uh, housing, for example. Uh, and here you see how Stockholm could look like with this new rule. And not to offend people too much, we put these sort of old classic Stockholm houses and stack them on top of each other. Uh, the, the, there's the political party center party saw that and, and asked uh, if we could do, help them in the, we had an election year today, uh, a year this year. Uh, if we could help them with their political manifest for Stockholm. So we've been doing a lot of projects for them this year, uh, how we could develop Stockholm and, and, and make Stockholm a denser city. So this is kind of the liberal green party. And their vision is that if we build dense, we can save our parks and so on, and we can use uh, existing infrastructure and so on. And I kind of agree with that, uh, uh, that thought. Oh, that's the way Stockholm should, should be able to grow. Uh, so there was a proposal for this site. As always in Stockholm, it takes you know, 20 years to do something. So there's a proposal there, seven story, of course. Uh, and they asked me, could you look at this and see if you could fit in more people if you, we skipped the seven story houses and replace them with skyscrapers? So I did that. So this is the typical seven story block. Uh, and first of all, I wanted to have this real division uh, between houses and not the fake one. Um, and then I uh, suggested that we should put skyscrapers in the front uh, next to the water because you, all, you always have a sun inside there anyway. And then we could go in and make smaller houses uh, closer to the, uh, to, the, to the city. And then you could also get in... Uh, you will not only have the four big building companies, you can actually have smaller building companies also that builds the sort of four or five story high uh, building. And then we leave the skyscrapers for the, for the big companies. Uh, so this is how it would look. Also classical facades. Uh, they wanted to look a bit like New York, but I went to London and I photographed row houses and then extended them and it looks like New York almost. Uh, Rending for that. Uh, and here you can see how it would look. Yeah. So I'm just going to check this three minutes left and I'm halfway. Uh, I've, I show this, this is a recent project, I show it because it's a fun project. Uh, this is an interior in Stockholm. Uh, the client uh, asked us, uh, could you do something that is sort of bourgeois? Uh, I, wanted to, I want people when they come into my apartment to see that I'm an intellectual. Uh, so we put in some you know, wine coolers and you know, if you build you know, these um, uh, bookshelves that are incorporated with the design, it says that you're a uh, you know, uh, uh, intellectual person. Um, we also had this floor, so we could, we, we were able to, this, you see this floor is a bit higher there, we were able to, to hit the bed and stuff under the floor and, and make shelves and so on uh, using the floor. But he also had this, uh, I always, when you get a client, you always go out and have dinner and you get a little bit drunk and then you kind of get, you know, the right information from the client. and. <laughs> And, and uh, he's, so this client, he's gay, and he said also, like, could, you, could we somehow, you know, get in some gay things in this? <laughs> and, and I said, you know, what do you mean by gay things? You know, you know things like gays like, you know, like with nice shoes, I don't know, you know. It's like, <laughs> uh, I, 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 more specifically, I want, uh, you know, I want, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of genitals of a man to be incorporated in, in, uh, in some details. <laughs> and he, he said that, uh, but it should be like, someone should ask like, is it or is it not? You know, be uncertain all the time, you know? 
So it was kind of fun to make. This is it's just being built. So this is uh, yeah. Here you see the shelves anyway, where you could uh, we could put down shoes in the, in the floor and so on. And uh, we actually just painted the pattern over it, and it becomes this quite nice effect. Uh, and we did some so these small things. Uh, for example, this pattern on the floor. I built this uh, uh, table and this small pattern uh, on the table that uh, if you don't know the story, you would say it's, I don't know, just a pattern. But if you know the story, you might see what, what it's, it's about. <laughs> I, I did this at the, I built this at the, at the school workshop. And I was, you know, there's a laser cutter doing the pattern. And uh, then the, the dean comes with a, a group. And, oh, there's Anders. He's a teacher. What are you doing? <laughs> 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 it was a good test because uh, uh, and they started asking, is this Art Nouveau and stuff like that, you know? I'm like, yeah, it's natural inspired, you know, but if you don't know the story, you might think it's... Yeah. Let's talk about Shopstick. Um, uh, well, we got an email uh, a couple of years ago from, from Lisa, who's up in the that corner, uh, and she said, could you uh, make this uh, project for us in the Indianapolis uh, Museum of Arts 100 Acres Park? And um, they wanted a seasonal space that could be, be used for concessions in the park to sell water snacks and so on, and she's kind of ended this mail with uh, think of it as a sculpture or maybe not think freely. It was really this assign, you know, assignment you could do anything on. Uh, this what <laughs> I usually show this for people when I sh show this project, but I'm pretty sure you know where Indiana is. So I sk <laughs> skip this part. But this is, this is the 100 Acres uh, Art Park. And, and as Donna said, if you haven't been there, you should really go there. It's a, it's a really nice, a nice place to visit. Uh, and it, when we arrived there, it had really some really nice uh, projects. Uh, as you see also, this the visitor pavilion. It's really nice architecture project. Um, and we kind of, uh, since this was to be a concession stand and so on, we wanted to be sort of in a central uh, location of the park also, where you could buy water and so on. So you see where the black dot is. It's, it's really where, where the two roads into the park meet. And this would be a good place sort of to when you enter this park to be able to, to, to buy some water and so on. And, uh, and we thought, uh, usually when you get an assignment or a commission, it's always like you have a lot of uh, sort of uh, restrictions that you, and that's what you made it, make the architecture out from. But here we, we didn't have uh, no restriction at all, almost. And it's actually kind of hard, you know, just make good architecture. That's a really tough challenge. Uh, so we thought, uh, let's, let's compare architecture to, to, to similar businesses uh, and what, what is great about them. And we compared architecture to, to the business of, of, of being a chef. Uh, and we thought that uh, if a chef would do a project in Indianapolis, he would probably look at what kind of local material you could find in Indiana, and, and he would probably try to serve them in the best way possible. You know, uh, if you have a good beef or something, you would just you know slice the beef and you know just make small small things with the beef, but try to serve it uh, as gentle as possible. And, and we thought this could be a, a very good strategy for us when we do this project in, in Indiana. That uh, let's try to look for the best raw materials in Indiana, and then try to refine them in the, in the best way possible. Uh, so we looked at some, some different materials in Indiana, the Indiana limestone, of course, and also straw or maybe uh, corn. Uh, but we also found this uh, state tree of Indiana, uh, which is the yellow poplar tree or the tulip poplar, uh, which is a very nice tree because it's standing here in Indiana where it's, you know, very flat and you have these big storms and so on and it's a huge tree and it's uh, standing straight uh, and uh, that makes it you know 
a really nice pillar or a beam somehow if you can stand on this these fields and and cope with all these things uh, so we wanted to to sort of serve the state tree of Indiana in the best way possible uh, so this was sort of our first sketch uh, which was really to use the strength of this tree and use it as a beam uh, and then uh, put uh, take all the stuff uh, uh, that was needed uh, from the tree, for example, the concession stand we can made, make from the bark from the tree and so on, and, and we can also take the construction wood from, from the tree. Um, so, and this was sort of a developed sketch that we de developed later, uh, when it was, you know, everything you can do with the state tree of Indiana. And it's all from, you know, if you bark the tree in the in the right period, uh, in spring, you can actually use that bark uh, as a facade material. It's a really beautiful facade material, and it's been tested also. It's in some villas here in Indiana. It's been standing there for almost 100 years. Uh, we also could actually make syrup out of the tree. Uh, if we, we took syrup from the right time, we could uh, take the leaves from the tree. Uh, and uh, one good thing also about the tree is even if it's like big, uh, it's, it's a quite fast growing tree, so it don't get rotten, like an oak, for example. So it's, it's a really good tree for, for construction purposes. And the programming under the tree is really based on that a lot of school kids come to, to the art park. And so we put in some swings and, and, and places uh, where you just can hang out and you know, drink your water and so on. Uh, so here you see these kind of cutting diagrams. We had a long, you know, we worked a lot with a structural engineer, you know, if we take away that part, you know, where is the, we, we wanted to find the, the, uh, the middle point of the weight, which is, which is here, and it's going to be standing on a wall, for example, it was important. And, and it was a lot of calculations, you know, from, from his side, you know, where to put, take away uh, a piece of wood and, and how much wood would, would we get then to build a concession stand under it. Uh, here's the tree we found. We started our first trip, we went out with this logger and uh, he had a lot of trees he could show so we actually we found this tree. It's with, with Anderson, right? Outside Anderson. Yeah, we found this tree. Uh, and this is when they're actually removing the tree. And we had a lot of thought also about that. How could you chop down a huge tree without breaking it? And one thing could be that you can actually, on the west coast, you can hover over it with a helicopter like that. And then you cut it and then you lift. Uh, but to be able to fly with it with a helicopter, we, you needed uh, permission right from all the landowners. So you need to go fast to a stream or something, that's the state land, and then you can go with it like this. We couldn't fix that, but Indiana, uh, Indianapolis Museum of Art has, this, uh, has their own police force. It's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> so they could uh, help us you know, uh, with, with you know, t taking the tree on a truck into the city. And here you see the trees being lifted. Here you see how they sort of start chopping down the rotten part in the, in the, in the yeah, lower end. You see it's not that much rotten in the tree, even if it's a really big tree. And here you see we debark it, and that was also an important thing that we would chop it down. I think it was in May or June or something uh, to be able to, to, uh, to take away the bark. Um, and here you see on, uh, the tree on a big truck. Uh, and here is a bad picture, but here is standing on the Indianapolis Museum of Arts. And here you see, we really like this, you know, just one guy with a motor saw doing these cuts. It's, it gets a really nice rough uh, uh, atmosphere to it. And here you see the concession stand being built by the parts take, taken away from the tree. Uh, and I, I'm so impressed by the carpenters in Indiana. We, we just had one piece of wood, you know, and said, could you do a double hang window out of this? And it's like, yeah, you give me three days. It's like well, amazing carpenters in this. Uh, 
And here you also see the bark facade coming up and so on. And here you see the uh, finished uh, result. We had to reinforce it with steel a bit. And that was basically because we couldn't test the tree uh, in advance, how strong the tree was. So, uh, but uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, and you see the bark facade and, and, and so on. And here you see Donna swinging. <laughs> Uh, and Donna was, yeah, you, you helped us with this your, uh, whole project. Uh, and here you see two happy architects. And uh, <laughs> you see, we also uh, kept some of the leaves from the tree and put it in the window. Uh, we always wanted to hand, it, hand out uh, ice cream to kids from our building. So that's what we're doing. Uh, so go and visit it. Uh, it's, it's, it's a nice building. Uh, now I'm uh, 10 minutes late, uh, but I chose something about the, uh, I just started a studio, I will go through it very fast. Uh, I've been teaching in the third year uh, in, in KTH uh, for, for three years, and I think we have a pretty good conceptual focus. We're good at, you know, getting the students to, to get good ideas, and uh, but uh, as maybe I mentioned before, when uh, uh, it's not so much happening, uh, you, you know, when the kids, when the students get out from school, it's uh, they end up uh, at a, at an office and they get disappointed and uh, they do all these apartment buildings, and then they come to Svensk Standard and we build floating lawns and stuff. <laughs> uh, so we think that. Um, to be able to sort of, you know, fuse these radical ideas and, you know, to, to be able to, to, to build architecture, you need to be, we need to uh, learn more and know more about the building process. Uh, so our studios, stu studio is all about building processes. Uh, and uh, so what we will do is that we will, you know, try to be like, you know, this Valraf journalist, you know, really being involved in the building processes, see what costs money, what doesn't cost money, uh, and be in different scales of building processes. So the first project we're doing right now is, is uh, we ask ourselves the question, how much is a small Swedish house in terms of manufacturing, you know, uh, doing the building components that comes to the Swedish, uh, comes to the small house? Uh, but also how much is, you know, of the money is, for example, materials, how much is, is, is workforce, uh, all of these questions. Uh, and then we will look at what is mass production, what's the benefits of mass producing a house. Uh, and then we will look at also who has the right to the site in Stockholm, uh, who has the right to build uh, on free land in Stockholm and how do you deal with that. And then uh, the last uh, course will be how much is a public building. But we just started with the first course, and we're building our own studio, which we thought would be a good task. Uh, so, and uh, what we're doing is that we're doing very fast sketches, and then we do decisions by voting. And then I give the students new restrictions, because I tell them that we have a lot of money and we can do whatever we want, but we don't. <laughs> so I give them new restrictions all the time, you know. Uh, because I think also that's a part of when you're actually working with a building, it will always come new restrictions. Uh, it will always be things that kind of mess up your architecture. So I'm trying to mess it up for them all the time. I think that's it's like being in a tennis game, you know. It's like you do a good ball and then you get it back and you have to think again and rethink and rethink. Uh, so, and to be able to actually, to, to afford to build our own studio, uh, we, we actually have to sell the house to someone. And in Sweden, you can build two houses without a building permit. Uh, one house is, uh, uh, is called the Attefallhus and it can be 25 square meters. Uh, and the other house is a Frigibu, which can be 15 square meters. And that's, uh, we thought if we could just push them together, it would be enough for our studio. And then we can just sell it to the carpenter as two single houses. So that's what we're building right now. And the students are making the, making the design of it. So we start early mornings. And then I just throw in surprises. If 
you know, I have, we have a plywood interior. I said, oh, sorry, but we bought some mahogany. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we find cheap things, you know, and we just throw them in the house. And, and uh, if you can't afford to, to build a, you know, buy a beam, we have to build the beam ourselves. And, you know, really going through all the, all the different parts of a building and uh, uh, inventing, trying, trying to invent new sandwich elements and so on. Uh, uh, so this is where the building was kind of when I left uh, almost uh, and uh, the, for the facade we, I divided them into different teams we have a facade team there they looked at different ways of treating wood and they found out that if we will burn the wood it, it, we, we won't have to paint it for 80 years so uh, it's a very we will get this very beautiful burned facade you look if you burn them in, in different uh, uh, different long time you will get this different kind of texture it looks really beautiful and uh, this is because we're gonna push the house it's a moving house uh, so we're testing it now we put on this train wheels and so on and we're standing on it and pushing it and so on and, but uh, I just mentioning this you can go into the blog and you can have a look because it's gonna be finished in two weeks and I think it's gonna <laughs> look beautiful thank you Yeah, I think if anyone wants to ask some questions, you can stay. Anyone? You have to do it in the mic. Um, hi, my name my name is Hui, and I actually get a lot of emission from KTH last year, but I decided to come here. So I'm kind of like interested in going to Stockholm someday. Sorry, sorry, I uh, take it again. I uh, didn't hear. Um, I'm going to ask you about KTH and yeah. Stockholm. Um, so, what do you think about the focus of KTH is about? Do you have any focus for the whole school, like sustainable design or uh, anything like digital publication? Uh, yeah. The, I, I think the main focus of the school. Yeah. What is it? If you didn't hear, it's, you asked about the main focus of the school, if you will go there as an exchange student, right? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, we don't have uh, this big uh, uh, general idea of what the school is. We have 10 stu studios, and one uh, or two is working with digital fabrication, and then we have a sustainable studio. Uh, we have some students that are focusing on, on, on urban planning. Uh, my studio is focusing on, on, on building processes, so it's, uh, it's, it's a school that tries to be, you know, the big school that has sort of a wide... Uh, uh, is it a stu uh, studio base where, where you can like, stay in a school like 20 hours per day? Before I, because I know some school in Europe, but you don't have the studio base project, so people, like students just came here for class and then go home to... Oh, it's, it's, it's very similar to this school. It's studio-based. Uh, you get your own studio, you get your own desk, and uh, you can work for 24 hours if you want to. We appreciate it if you do. Uh. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks for the presentation. And um, in the beginning, you were mentioning the restrictions that you have from um, the building code and so on. Do you feel, however, that has challenged your architecture a lot better? Um, would you say those restrictions to a certain aspect have been positive, or would you s see them as ultimately detrimental to the building process? No, I, th I think a, a lot of the restrictions are, are there for a good reason. I mean, for example, that you should be able to, to, to go with on a wheelchair everywhere and so on. And it's actually, most of them are positive in the sense that, uh, I mean, it, 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 it hires the lower standard somehow. It also says that you can't, you know, build any, anything at all, you know, like shit projects. It's like really, you need to have a proper kitchen, you need to have that, you need to have that. So, 
I'm not so restricted by these rules actually. I think if you if you see them as a as a good thing, you you could just take advantage of them. Really, it's it's, it's often for the better for the architect. But sometimes when it comes to experiments, you know, for example, if we need to build student houses, uh, maybe we could you know maybe not every student apartment needs its own bathroom where you can come in with a wheelchair. Maybe we can, you know, every 50th could have that, and if you break your leg, you can move into that one. And that would save us a lot of space. So, so if you look at a student apartment today, it's a half of the student apartment is a bathroom, you know. And that's, so in some senses, it's, it's, it's bad, but in, in most cases, it's, 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 it's quite good. And it's always nice to test them, you know, try to bend the rules a little bit and uh, see what happens. And they're not set in stone either. I mean, if you're going to build on a mountaintop, you, I mean, you can, you can talk to the municipality and you can, you know, come to an agreement. Um, I was noticing through your presentation that you really focused on, uh, or kind of made comments on, them, like, this new, at least I've noticed it as a new um, trend in contemporary architecture of the integration of like the concept of fun and not taking architecture so seriously and even putting a narrative to architecture like the story with the pavilion which I thought was I thought that was amazing <laughs> love that idea um, do you think that's kind of a trend that's going to be more developed throughout the years whereas the modernists were taking themselves seriously with trying to find this yeah. universal I thing? think so I, <coughs> you know if you compare it to other art forms you know uh, I think architecture could be much more than just, you know, I mean, it could be fun, it can be dead serious, it could be, if you compare it to movies, you know, Ingmar Bergman, the most serious director in Sweden, you know, that uh, controlled everything, he made comedies too, you know, and uh, there's always a laugh in a, <laughs> in a, in a, I mean, Chekhov called him, call his uh, plays for, uh, he called them comedies, you know. Uh, so I think absolutely there's, uh, 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 I think it will happen. And I think also it's kind of interesting when you know all this uh, digital uh, architecture, you know, people are doing architecture on Minecraft and uh, I think that will really, I think that will s change the, <laughs> the occupation a little bit. And uh, I mean, if you comp I would say if you comp compared to music, it's like, uh, you know, you have punk bands and you have classical mu music and so on. And uh, I think sometimes that we are just the classical musicians. <laughs> and I'm waiting for the punk band to arrive. <laughs> and, you know, just take everybody, you know, and <laughs> sell all the houses and so on. Yeah. Yeah.